that invitation came, I think, well over a year ago. It's been on the books for quite a while. My thanks to all the members of the Lane Literary Guild. And my thanks to the Eugene Public Library for this gracious, beautiful hospitality today. And my thanks to Kathleen Flanagan, Washington State's Poet Laureate, who is with us here today, right there. Um, I am going to read from a brand new book today. It is called Understory. It will officially launch uh, in Portland at Powell's on April 29th, but it's launching in Eugene right here today, <laughs> ahead of Portland. Um, the descriptive uh, note on the cover of the book promises poems occasioned by a wide geography and characterized by a large embrace. And the book does contain a variety of types of poems, yes. That descriptive uh, note also promises, quote, a delving into the phonic, as in C-H-T-H-O-N-I-C as in a delving into an underworld, into understory. So today I would like to read for you um, a few of those understory poems. A few years ago, when Multnomah County briefly made same-sex marriages legal, I attended the spring wedding of two women friends, a wedding at which I met for the first time, or at least I thought I met, the mother of one of the marrying women, Shape Shifter. The mother of one of the marrying women will turn out to be her father, now a woman, who wears her long gray hair pulled away from her bone-shadowed face to hang in a fall down her spine. Below a hint of breasts, the skirt of her dress drapes off her belly slope to end swaying above her ankles. She says to me, taking my hand, Kate is my daughter, and I take her as saying, I'm Kate's mother, thinking tall, so tall to be Kate's mother, not thinking but knowing how old women and old men grow to look like both. I see dress, long hair, barrettes, old woman belly. I see Kate's mother, an elder woman making her stiff-stepped way across the living room after the wedding, speaking to each guest. A woman has married another woman here today. Hosanna, unthinkable in my life's early years, and I think we people have finally learned something. I will not learn until days from now that the mother of one of the brides is really her father, changed as a shaman might change, to be able to step near spirits without frightening them away. The day I learn Bees will be out, working blossoms, a breeze out moving leaves. On a day blind blue with the sunshine, a sparrow will clatter in a gutter, spooling clutter to make a nest. Stunned, I will see for a moment how every shape in our green world is indeed a father is a 
mother giving a child a way, giving a way to shimmer, a way to endless shift. That place between waking and sleeping is a cusp between two worlds. A cusp between the waking world and the world waiting for you elsewhere. The elsewhere world where the dead can see you, can talk to you, can be seen by you. Drowse. Nowadays, the god has disappeared into sleep, reaching out right now to pull your eyelids down. Your eyes blink. You're here, not here. They're open, then not. Weight drains awareness away, gathers it into the pool beneath. This water is a darkness where the dead cajole and see through disguise in one swift glance. Taking you in, their eyes have taken you in. There, deep, among the living and dead who are no longer either or, but both. You're afloat in the God's iris pool. Persephone. Demeter's daughter? Is Greek mythology suddenly flooding back into your mind? I think most fifth graders study some Greek mythology. Persephone, Demeter's daughter, the beautiful young woman abducted by Hades, the lord of the underworld. She knew better than to eat any of the underworld food that Hades offered to her. She knew that each bit that she swallowed was a swallow of death. Each bit of that world she consumed tied her more closely to that underworld. And the dream world is an underworld. The dream world is a part of the phonic world. In the world lying worlds below. To eat a morsel of the underworld's dream food is to die a bit. So that's what I've been doing each night in my dream life. Eating and dying, eating and dying. No. Not so. I don't recall a dream when I actually ate. One when I fried wolf meat in a cast iron skillet, yes. And dreams where wedding cakes lifted their tears like storied buildings white in the sun. But none where I sat moving food from platter to plate, balancing forkfuls into my mouth. But wait, foolish me, to be busy thinking of ways I might remember my way out of death. No doubt a spatter from that searing wildness found the lips I licked. Surely, I slipped a crumb of that dream cake under my tongue.
Also in Greek mythology, the sun and the moon are twins, Apollo and Artemis. Their mother, Leto, is the daughter of Titans. Their father is Zeus, the king of all gods. Leto's beauty, having caught his philandering eye at one moment. When his wife, when Zeus's wife, Hera, finds out, she takes her anger out on poor Leto. In her jealousy, Hera commands all lands to shun Leto, giving her no place to give birth to the twins. Leto finally finds a floating island. It's not attached to land, so it's not actually land. A place where she can give birth to the twins. But Hera's curse is so strong that it makes her, Leto, labor horribly and long. This poem is spoken in the voice of the moon, Artemis, who is, by the way, one of the virgin goddesses. She spurns lovers. She does not take a husband. The word call is in this poem, C-A-U-L, as in that membrane that can be covering a newborn's face. The moon recounts the birth of the sun. The first twin out of the womb I rose, chilled and pale, busy making my peace with the air, until I saw my mother still labored. A huge knot lurched in that belly I'd so recently left, shoving first against her ribs, then toward the knees she clutched. I watched my brother lunge inside her, amazed there'd ever been room for me. For days she strained with that pain, crying for me to help her, but what could I do? No way to wrench my brother from her womb, nothing to do but stay by her side, until she could wedge her back and drawn up knees between two tree trunks to push him out. From the first moment, he was, of course, gorgeous, golden, pink, glowing with the pulse of heat. The women gathered around to ooh, and ah, twins, how lovely, they said, looking from him to me, careful to skirt the problem of such unequal light and size. True, I would become my father's darling girl, showered with stars, set by his own hand to plump and dwindle to rain in the night sky. Even so, I have good reason for being withdrawn. How can others blame me if I'm chaste? What do they know about someone still wrapped in the silver call of her mother's pain? My only light gathered, yes, from another's dazzling face. There is an Irish tradition, and um, as I understand it, not among all Irish people, but among a few, and I believe this is a tradition that is somewhat from the old days. That is a tradition um, in which at a wake, some man, and oftentimes a man who has been hired for the occasion, 
Uh, some man must eat the contents of a bowl of death, a bowl containing the deceased person's sins before the wake can end. A man before the wake can end. Someone must eat from the bowl filled with death. Only a man, they say, is fit to dip from it the spoonfuls of pale pudding. Only a he will do to empty its sweetness dollop by dollop. So neighbors are finally free to murmur Sorry for your troubles. To find their wraps buried on the unfamiliar bed and slip away. A man's job. Or so they say. All the world knows who made what's in that bowl. A woman heats measured milk over blue flames drifting sugar and tapioca grains into that scalding froth. She lifts some to her tongue to taste for sweetness, stirs until the translucent bubbles look like the work of a tireless queen bee. Pouring the finished mass into a crockery bowl, she carries its weight out to cool in the pantry. She knows soon enough there'll be the mother and aunts crying, those poor dear souls, handkerchiefs knotted like damp dross at their eyes. Then will come the real work of day-to-day -day grieving. A woman's job. Now, in her mouth, the faint aftertaste. In her breath, a ghost of vanilla and cream. My grandfather was a furrier. He had a fur shop in northeast Portland on Sandy Boulevard. My grandmother worked with him there at the fur shop. Growing up, I adored my grandparents. I spent whatever time I could with them. Weekends, if I could, and if I was at their house on the weekends, I went to the fur shop with them on Saturdays. So I spent a lot of time in that fur shop as a little girl. And as you might imagine, I had very ambivalent feelings about the fur shop. Um, the furs were beautiful, almost irresistible. You know, it was irresistible. It just could, I couldn't resist reaching out to touch them. And it was the livelihood of my grandparents, and I loved them. But I also I saw that fur shop as a great house of animal ghosts. All the pelts, all the skins there. This poem is called, And Where Does It Come From? This Animal Soul. The term animal soul is a part of many cultures and of many Native American cultures. Uh, it can refer to something in a clan. It can be something totemic. Uh, one's animal soul can be a source of power, a source of connection to the spirit world. This poem contains another term, guard hair. And if you know nothing about furs, you might not recognize that at all. Guard hairs are the longer, stiffer hairs that curve above the soft under fur and literally protect it. And where does it come from, this animal soul? From inside the echoing rooms of my grandfather's fur shop, bit by bit. I was young. The fur was sleek, soft. I didn't know. 
Even the stiffest guard hairs gleamed. My animal soul pieced itself together each time I touched a pelt. My grandfather wet down the skins and with his fine needle-tipped nails stretched them on a pine board. Their musk rivered into my breath. On her black enameled machine, Nana sold linings of satin to conceal each soft napped underside. For too long, I didn't realize what my fingers had gathered into me, moat by moat, as I grew. The sorrow, those eyes caught in blinding light, a leg only half bitten in half by a trap's metal jaw. My animal soul has countless names, blue fox, red fox, silver, ermine, beaver, fitch. I was a child then. I did know. A terrible beauty had found me, seal and coney and caracal. My hands reach for them all. And I will end with um, what those were understory poems. Maybe this is an overstory poem. A poem of um, celebration. A poem of exhalation. It's a summer poem. And it was occasioned by um, me coming out into the garden on the side of my house, the flower garden, I'm like a perennial flower garden, um, early one summer morning. And it was after a night that had been unexpectedly cold. So I went out into the garden early in the morning, and there, in the center of a number of rudbeckia blooms, you know, those kind of beautiful showy daisy blooms. There in the center were bees, bees that were stunned, and but still alive, but just barely moving. Bees that had obviously been in the center of those flowers all night long. This poem, Here to Wait Out the Dark, is spoken in direct address, spoken directly to those stranded bees. Here to wait out the dark. Surprised by the cold when last evening's clouded sky went quickly clear in summer dusk, you knots of ink and yellow stripes were caught fast in open blooms held overnight in powdery palms. Little stars come earthly close, now morning's here, time to warm you out of a flower's pollen. Three, four, five in a blossom, motionless, your wings and barbs crimped by dew, who better than you to tell a story of light slipping over dawn's lip into the basin of day. You stir, uncurl, to become the sun's furious buzzing, fever flown up into this world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>